This story is a little bit different. In this particular story, I was on the other end. I was the creeper. I see so many stories posted where someone gets creeped on, but I thought I'd break the mold a little bit and post my story. Maybe seeing through the eyes of the creeper and gaining a little understanding into the mindset of a person committing these acts would be a welcome perspective shift. I'll start with a little background on me so you can understand the type of person I am. I didn't have a traumatic childhood, I was never abused, neglected, or any of the stereotypical serial killer stuff. In fact, it was quite the opposite. If anything, my family gave me too much and was overly protective. I think this is actually what led to my issues. I was never allowed to go to other kids' houses unless my mother had met their parents first, which led to me being left out of a lot. I never really learned how to relate to other people and I'm socially awkward and have anxiety issues to this day anytime I have to deal with anyone I don't know that well. As far as looks go, I know people tend to expect creepers to be overweight balding guys with thick glasses and bad skin. You know, the typical 40-year-old basement dweller. I'm sorry to disappoint, but I've always been told I'm a decently attractive guy. In short, relationships have always been a huge struggle for me. However, I am still a human being and I still have a need for attention and affection. The problem is, I'm like a dog chasing a car. I don't know what to do with it when I finally get it, and it usually ends in pain. Anyway, on to the actual story here, since I know you're not all listening to this just to listen about my depressing life history. I was in my early 20s, just after college. The local rock radio station I listened to got a female DJ who was on during the time I was usually listening to the radio. She seemed cool, played a lot of stuff I liked, and was fun to listen to, so I would tune in pretty much every night. She would occasionally talk a little bit about her personal interests, and I shared most of them. She liked video games, comic books, rock music, obviously, and other somewhat nerdy, especially for a girl, things. I was eventually convinced that we had so much in common that she was the perfect girl for me. I followed her on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, pretty much every social media page she had. Even tracking down her personal Facebook and not just the public one she advertised on the radio. I talked to her through social media whenever I could think of something to say, which most of the time just ended up being song requests. But she was always friendly and even gave me a shout out on the air one night. I know I'm sounding really creepy, but I swear my intentions were 100% innocent at this point. I really just liked this girl a lot and wanted to get to know her, but had no idea how to go about it. I started to go to every concert the radio station sponsored, which in our smaller town were not very big or very often. We don't have any kind of arena or anything, so they were all at bars with a few hundred people at most. We got some nationally known bands, but nothing major. They were mostly up and coming bands or bands who were past their prime. The biggest thing they had was in a field behind a bar with a couple thousand in attendance. Anyway, she was also there, of course, since she worked for the station and because the concerts were so small, I would always see her. I could never work up the guts to go talk to her because, at this point, I had put her on this pedestal in my mind and I just couldn't talk to her unless I was sure I would say the right things. I couldn't have her first impressions of me being anything less than perfect. So most of the time, I just got drunk and talked to whoever was near me instead. After a while of this, I ran into a guy I worked with at one of the concerts. I was already pretty drunk at that point, so I ended up telling him that I liked this girl, but I was too afraid to talk to her. His response was to drag my drunken self up to her and strike up a conversation. When I'm drunk, I am actually pretty outgoing, so surprisingly things went well and I left very excited about everything. I sent her a message on Facebook a couple days later and she remembered me. 
which was really encouraging and I ended up asking her if she'd like to hang out sometime. She agreed and I nearly broke my desk I was so excited. Because she worked nights on the radio as well as a second job, uh, apparently four hours a night on a small town radio station doesn't pay the bills, I ended up meeting her for lunch at the mall on her break. Lunch didn't go so well. My sober self clearly wasn't as charming as my drunken self and things were rather quiet and awkward. In desperation, I started talking about all the things we had in common and eventually I got really desperate and told her I thought I might be falling for her. In hindsight, probably not the best thing to say to a girl who just met you and she was understandably creeped out. She politely excused herself to go back to work and I sat there wanting to smash my head onto the table. I knew I had blown my chances with her. Instead of admitting defeat though, I just had to keep on trying. I messaged her on Facebook about a thousand times over the next couple of weeks. I was apologizing for coming on too strong and trying to get another shot. She responded a few times and was polite, but a lot less friendly than before. Eventually, she blocked me and looking back, I can't say I blame her. At the time though, I was distraught. Then my sadness turned to anger. At first I was angry at myself more than anything, but then I started thinking things like, I was never anything but nice to her, why can't she just get to know me? I decided I needed to talk to her in person again, but she was clearly not going to meet me at this point. So I would hang around her store in the mall, but I always seemed to miss her. After thinking about it today, I suspect they probably sent her to the back to hide when they saw me coming. But at the time, I just thought she must work a different schedule every day. Finally, I waited for her after work at the radio station. This was my worst idea yet. As I mentioned, she was on the air at night, so it was after midnight when she came outside and got in her car to go home. I followed her. Even at the time, I realized I was being creepy, but I was so desperate to be with this girl that I didn't care. I mean, this sort of thing happens all the time in the movies, and the girls eventually end up with the guy, and they have this crazy romantic story to tell, right? Real life is not like the movies. Well, she apparently called the cops on the way back to her place because they pulled in right behind us and dragged me out of the car. I was arrested and ended up on probation with a restraining order. I never had any intentions of hurting her, but I understand that she had no way of knowing that at the time. Other than a handwritten apology letter, which was read and delivered to her by a police officer, I've had no further contact with her. She left the radio station and moved to another city shortly after. I've been through court-ordered therapy and some of my issues have gotten better. I actually have a girlfriend now and a pretty healthy relationship. Although I still suffer from anxiety and depression, I'm managing it and living a reasonably happy life now. I haven't creeped on anyone since. The place I worked at was a campground in a provincial park on the Alaska Highway, four hours north of Fort Nelson and two hours south of the Yukon slash British Columbia border. The best part about this park was the fact that it had a beautiful nature hot springs which attracts tourists from all over North America every summer. I lived in an old trailer on a separate part of the campground where the rest of the staff lived. I quickly got used to living in a place where I had no running water, no electricity, no cell phone service, and no internet. And of course, driving four hours to Fort Nelson every two weeks to get groceries and do my laundry. Life was pretty sweet. I got to hike, go for late night dips in the springs, make some traveling friends, and spend some quality time in nature. 
My job at the campground was park facility operator, which was general maintenance and cleaning of campsites, gatehouse attendant, wildlife interpreter, and sometimes I had a few security shifts here and there. The feeling of living in the woods was much different than the feeling of living in a city as far as safety goes. In the city I'm from, there are people around. You are aware of the fact that your house or apartment could get broken into, but emergency services are quick to respond and neighbors are also a plus. However, in the woods, I felt more vulnerable. The closest police were four hours away and I lived in a trailer that was run down enough that it could easily get broken into. Plus, I mean, it was pretty dark and anyone could sneak around easily at night. I was already on edge going to bed every night. The trailer next to mine was abandoned by the previous manager of the campground after his son had shot himself in the head inside of it. The previous manager had promised numerous times that he would hire a company to drive up from Fort Nelson and tow the trailer away. But that never happened, not while I lived there at least, and nobody seemed to care about it too much. I went into the trailer once, saw the blood and stuff still on the wall, and never went in again. Back in the 90s, there was also a fatal bear attack at the hot springs. We all had to read the incredibly gruesome and detailed police report about it for our bear aware training. So. Yeah, unsettling to say the least. One night, at probably around 2 in the morning, I'm asleep inside my trailer and am woken up to a very loud banging on my trailer door. Reasonably shaken, I look outside the window next to my bed and see a car with its lights on, and two men standing at my door. I can feel the blood drain from my face. This is the moment I've been scared of the entire summer. Through the door, I say, How can I help you? And one of the guys, clearly hammered out of his mind, starts rambling on about something. No matter how hard I try, I cannot understand what he is saying. I say, Sorry, I don't understand what you're trying to tell me. And the other guy starts frantically trying to explain something in the same drunken state as the first guy. I decide at this point that they don't mean any harm and I open the door to talk to them. They look visibly shaken and I can tell that they are desperate for my help but they don't have the mental capacity of a person sober enough to coherently tell me what's wrong. One of the dudes starts telling me a very long story that I managed to piece together through all of his slurring and hiccuping. Basically, he says that him and his friend are on vacation. They came up from Fort Nelson to party, they had a really long drive, they were at the hot springs, they were having beers, they were sorry about having beers, they weren't drunk, clearly, and then he drops the bomb that somebody's running around the campground stabbing people. I look at the guy telling me the story and I notice he has blood all over his clothing. I say, someone is going around stabbing people? And he replies, Yes, someone's running around stabbing everybody. Then the other guy yells, Come on, let's go, and they hop into the aforementioned car and speed off before I can question them further. Now I'm standing at my trailer door, in the darkness, alone, thinking there's a maniac running around wielding a knife. I have no phone, and I know that the only person who has a phone is the ranger and his cabin is about a five minute walk away from my trailer. I remember that I have a radio, so I run inside my trailer, lock the door, and try to get the ranger on the radio. His radio is off. Of course. The only thing I can do at this point is go to the ranger's cabin and notify him of the situation. I get out of my trailer and run through the darkness across the maintenance ground past the creepy suicide trailer, through a thicket and straight towards the ranger's cabin. Every single noise I hear from the surrounding forest is making my heart pound faster. I keep imagining this maniacal man sneaking through the bushes, entering people's tents and slashing everybody like some bad horror film. I get to the ranger's cabin and pound on the door. He answers within a few minutes, visibly sleep deprived, and I tell him the whole story. 
While I'm there, he calls the police and they tell him that they are on their way and will be there in four hours. The ranger grabs his gun, walks me back to my trailer and says, Don't let anybody in. I stay up the rest of the night listening for any sort of disturbance around me. The intense kind of listening where you're concentrating so hard on any external sounds that might be made that you almost feel deaf from the silence. After about two hours of doing this, my trailer starts rocking back and forth. I freeze, my heart drops. I hear the sound of someone breathing extremely heavy and I'm thinking, this is it, the knife wielding maniac is going to murder me and this trailer is going to be another one they have to tow away. I'm just sitting there, on my bed, in my trailer, as it's rocking, waiting for the maniac to stop tormenting me and just break through the window and stab me. I'm still listening intently to the heavy breathing and that's when I hear a grunt. A very non-human sounding grunt. I get a feeling that it's not what I think it is and I peer out the window of my trailer and it's a fucking bison. It's scratching its back on the side of my trailer causing it to rock back and forth. Great fucking timing, bison. The RCMP get there at around 6.30 a.m. and proceed with their investigation for 10 hours. They close off the springs and the entire campground turns into an episode of CSI. We don't hear anything about what took place during the night until the investigation is over. Apparently, there was a guy at the springs who made a lewd comment about one of the females in another group, which resulted in an argument. The guy disappeared and returned an hour later with a knife, stabbed two of the guys in the group, and booked it back to Fort Nelson. But not before stopping at my trailer with his buddy to tell me about the incident, of course. Yeah, one of the guys at my trailer? He was the dude stabbing people. My guess is that him and his friends stopped by my trailer to try and make it seem like they were innocent. Drunken logic. The two guys that were stabbed survived, which is good. For many days following this incident, I was cleaning up blood-soaked clothing and rags from random places all over the campground. So, this just happened. Bit of a background of the last 25 minutes. I just got home from a reasonably big night. It's 4.30 a.m. and fucking hot in this part of Australia right now. I walked in the door and opened the fridge and was so happy to find three icy cold beers in the fridge. I take two of them and walk upstairs to bed to read and drink myself into a boozy sleep. My first issue, the beers are not twist tops. They need a bottle opener. And after some sloppy, drunken attempts at using the handle of the draw of my bedside table, I head back downstairs to use an actual bottle opener. I turn on the kitchen lights, which are so bright that they make the space behind my eyes burn. I squint around to find the bottle opener, which I can't find, so I use the solid edge of a large kitchen knife. It's a risky choice, but the bottle cap is now off the beer and I'm happy. I turn off the alien blinding kitchen light and go to head upstairs, but something through the front window of my house that looks onto the street catches my eye. I stop at the bottom of the stairs and all the hairs on the back of my neck and arms stand up. I turn my head slowly and my eyes and brain are trying to make sense of what I'm looking at. It looks like a rain drenched woman in a fancy white dress gazing at me through the window. Oh fuck, it, it actually is. I pause and take the longest inhale of my life. She's glaring at me like she hates me. She has mascara running down her face and she is drenched from the rain. Her arms are extended and she's leaning her head towards me like her body language was trying to say, look at me, look at what you've done. I'm shitting bricks, but the rational side of my brain kicks in and I think, Shit, is, is she okay? Does she need help? I slowly walk over to the window, her gaze still locked onto mine. We are now literally within one meter of each other. I state loudly through the glass. Are you okay? Do you need help? Is anyone with you? Then it dawns on me. 
My gate is locked and there is an 8 foot high fence which is very difficult to climb. How did she get in? She doesn't respond to my inquiry, she just keeps that hateful look in her eyes. We stood there for about another 30 seconds. I was looking around nervously trying to make sense of this and she was just glaring into my soul. And then she finally opened her mouth as if to say something. But it wasn't words that came out of her mouth. It was an insanely high pitched meowing noise. I know it sounds crazy and then she starts clawing at the window with her novelty sized fingernails. What the fuck? I'm frozen, I don't know what to do, she's clearly not very well, not, not very well at all. Then in the background behind the fence I see another woman, probably 20 something, dressed in a short black club dress with the glow of her phone lighting up her face. She sees the woman in white at my window and yells, Michelle, you pissed bitch, that's the wrong fucking house. The rain-soaked, nightmare, Catwoman's eyes go from I hate you and want you to die to Oh my god, I'm so sorry slash embarrassed. And she runs over to the fence and impressively Army Commando flings herself over it. I can then hear a group of ladies pissing themselves laughing saying how Jason's house is number 25, not 23, you fucking idiot. That poor guy is probably going to call the cops now. All I know is that I'm so happy that I was on the receiving end of a misdirected prank and that I didn't have to be killed by a well-dressed hybrid cat demon woman. And now I have to go back down to the kitchen to open my other beer, but I'm still too afraid. Hey everyone, I hope you enjoyed the video. This one had some pretty different stories than usual, hopefully you could appreciate that. I like to keep you all guessing. And for anyone who wants to call that second story fake, it's 100% verified. What story did you enjoy most and why? Let me know in the comments. Anyways, I wanted your opinion on something. I plan on doing a paramedic slash EMT slash police experiences video. It would be just short slash medium length stories slash experiences of, well, paramedic slash EMT stories, obviously. I have a lot of them ready, but they're all very depressing and gruesome and violent. They're also not really told in the perspective of storytelling like my usual videos. They're written down more like a friend telling a close friend an experience. Nonetheless, they're all very interesting. People dying is never a good thing of course, but some of these are just so strange and eerie. Like I said, if it's something you want to hear, let me know. Don't just say yes because I asked you, I want your honest opinion. While I'm talking to you all, I just want to let you know that I'm still trying to get some good night shift stories, so if you have any, please send them in. Also, I'm still looking for more thumbnail artists. If you've seen the art for my thumbnails and you think you could do digital art and stuff like that, don't hesitate to send me some of your work into the email in the description and get in contact with me. That's about it. Once again, hope you enjoyed the video and stay safe.